بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم کل حل نبیکم بلکفرین اعمال الذین ظل شائیہم فی الحیات الدنیا وہم یحسبون انہم یحسنون سنعا سلوات Before I delve into the subject of uh, what makes the message of Karbala so endearing and how can it transform us. Since Rumi was mentioned, it reminded me of something that really connects to the subject. Over the days we've been talking about development, rituals, multicultural society, and every step that we take there is a judgment to make in some ways. Do I go right? Do I go left? Do I do X? Do I do Y? When it comes to judgments, you make a judgment based on what you are going to do. You make a judgment based on who you are. What we tend to do, and this is where Rumi comes in, that sometimes as we make judgments for ourselves, we become judgmental upon others. Safe space was mentioned here by my dear friend Raza. That we become judgmental. And this is one of the areas where we restrict ourselves, our vision, our society. The societies are stifled because we are afraid of other people becoming judgmental upon us so I cannot go on a path. And Rumi said so beautifully that out there, beyond the idea of wrongdoing and right doing, that's a translation, wrongdoing and right doing, there's a field. I will meet you there. There is a field and I will meet you there, meaning that yes, we're not saying you suspend judgment on what is right and what is wrong. But you, you do not become judgmental because you don't know the mind of another person. You don't know what is his inner, what is his zahir, what is his batin. Let Allah be the judge. For you or for me, it is for me to judge myself. And this is where sometimes we are at a crossroads when we sit in this assemblies and we say that we are crying and tomorrow inshallah the subject will be covered in detail but just to introduce that we sit in the camp of Imam Hussain al-Islam and sometimes we think that we are in the camp of Imam Hussain al-Islam crying upon Imam Hussain but sometimes our acts show otherwise now, I'm not saying that we are sitting in the camp of Yazid, Nauzubillah, but sometimes there is this middle path with the Kufans adopted. They were neither here nor there. And when the entire tragedy of Karbala passes through them, having called Imam Hussain al-Islam, they let him down. And even after when the, as, uh, the tragedy passed, a lot of them became re remorseful, regretful, but it stopped there. There was the Tawabun movement where some people took up arms, some people tried to avenge, but the majority of the Kofans remained almost unaffected by the tragedy of Karbala. Today, we make a statement that what makes the message of Karbala endearing. And truly, 200 million people across the world, today, in the next few days, in particular, on the day of Ashur, will come together. Hardly any Shia child will remain absent when the Ashura is commemorated. Some come for 10 days, some for a few days. But wherever he or she may be, so on the day of Ashur, you will see 
the shism bubbling out of somebody who has been so remote. This is the pull of Sayyid al-Shuhada. This is the pull of Karbala. But if you allow it to just stay there, the emotion just stays there, and then for the rest of the months, we go our merry way, and then we cannot seek transformation, we cannot expect transformation. What is the difference between change and transformation? Change normally is external. Transformation is internal. Change is usually comes through rationality, through the head, that I don't have a choice but to change, and therefore I will change. As we said before, that you can either adopt change, you can ignore change, or you become an agent of change. If you become an agent of change, you are at the table. Otherwise, you're on the table and you'll be the menu. Because somebody else will affect your life. So when it comes to change, change is external. Because you're using the word transform here, it's important to make some clarity and some distinctions. Because sometimes the words are used interchangeably. Transformation and change. And there's a whole host of theories that come about in terms of change and transformation. This is not the place for it just to, so you can go back and read about it, perhaps think about it. Transformation is from within. Transformation is from the heart. And when there is that will to say, I want to move on, I'm trying to lose weight, which I am. When some outside force, external force, is put on me, I'm given some, some pills to take and whatever it is, and I feel that there's a microwave approach and something will change me, normally it does not happen. But if I have will to say that this is going to be a transformation within me, and I will holistically go, go on and do a numerous things, different things, to actually ensure that I reach that goal, then there is some chance that you will. But if you go to an expert and say, well, you know, I want to lose weight, and yes, you will, they give you $200 worth of stuff, which is not going to do because it's from outside. Change is from outside, transformation from within, Karbala has the potential because if Karbala is only external to us that this is an ancient tragedy that I am remembering because this was my Imam and I am paying respect to the Shuhada of Karbala I am paying respect to Bibi Zainab Salamullahi Alaiha and I truly salute them for what they did and I leave it outside me and I expect that change will come, it will not come. That change is not going to, it may change me within these 10 days. I will religiously come here, I will think about it, and after 10 days, as the emotions go a little low, then it's back to normal. But transformation is something that if I've truly imbibed the message of Karbala, and that is what we have been trying to explain and, and, and work together, how do we transform ourselves and our societies? And the ayah that I began with is a reflection for us. We're having thought that we are going through these days of Asa, and we think that we are doing good deeds, Allah says, shall we show you the losers? Those whose affairs in this world have become unsuccessful, and what is more is they think that they're doing good deeds. We pray to Allah that we are not amongst those people. But when it comes to the basis of change, transformation, then we need to seek that level of transformation. So today we will be talking about what makes the message of Karbala so endearing and how can it transform us and inshallah in the days to come we will complete this to say that are we truly in the camp of Imam Hussain al-Islam. So what is Karbala? Some have said that this is something that awakened the consciences of a sleeping ummah. There were people like the Tawabun amongst others who woke up after the tragedy to say this is not right. And it has continued 
to make an impact within societies. And because of Karbala, transformative leaders have arisen. They look at the example of Imam Hussain al -Islam. A change leader is one who try to change things in a society from outside. A transformative leader becomes an agent of change himself or herself. Gandhi was a transformative leader. Oddly enough, Gandhi never held a public position. But he was a transformative leader. When he went on the Sabarmati walk, the salt walk that he did, he did not say that go for a walk, go, go and protest. He said, I am going to protest. Those who will follow me will follow me. He was in it. Indeed, he is known to have said that there go my people. I must follow them because I am their leader. You take the people with you. You are a transformative leader. When you look at Karbala, you look at every, every angle of Karbala, you will see that the shohada led by Imam Hussain al-Islam, this was a transformation taking place. Habib ibn Mazahir was a transformative leader. If you read and if you look at the conversations that people like Habib and others had with the companions, you will see that they were out there on the forefront trying to do what they needed to change. They were part of the change. And this is the awakening of a heedless community which shook the very foundations of the Umayyad regime. What this does is it evokes strong emotions and intellectual thoughts. But today, as the centuries go by, the event of Karbala, the tragedy of Karbala, goes far beyond the Banu Umayyah. Karbala changed the course of history. I am preaching to the choir, we all believe that, that Karbala changed the course of history. Karbala was a paradigm, which is an enduring paradigm, which has no parallel in the history of humanity in terms of what it was able to do to define between right and wrong, to define what was evil and what was good. But in terms of lifting this veil of heedlessness for today, for us, sometimes, and we've been talking about this, that there is an overemphasis of rituals which has caused a separation and sometimes even a deviation from the core message of Karbala. The people have sometimes become oblivious of the true purpose of Karbala because rituals have taken center stage and the actual message seems to have been eclipsed. I submit to you that this is not a microwave approach that we can use by merely holding gatherings and rituals. Yes, these rituals will generate that warmth as we mourn Sayyidu Shuhada. But does it lead to an internal revolution? There is no microwave approach. We have to strive to do something. Mullah Nasruddin wanted to learn music. And he goes to a teacher and says, how long does it take for me to learn how to play music? And he was told 10 years. It'll take you 10 years to learn how to play music. So he said, okay, in that case, I will come in the 10th year. We want to have instant gratification to say, why is it that we attend all these majalis? We go to, we, we, shall we try and change the format of the majlis? Shall we try and change the lecturer? Shall we try and do this and all these things? We try, this is a microwave approach. It's not about changing the format. It's about changing ourselves internally. It's about being authentic. It's about feeling the pulse of Karbala and ensuring that we understand the essence of it. 
It's not just enough to say that I desire to change. Two things that we need to focus on. Purity of intention and sincerity of purpose. And secondly, it's the idea of action, amal. So these are the two ingredients because after ilm actually comes the action. To have action without knowing about it. So Karmala teaches us two lessons. One of knowledge and one of action. And the azad, the mourning for the imam and his companions is a dynamic force that has carried the revolution of Karbala through the ages, through these two items. Knowledge and action. It cannot be limited to rituals. There needs to be action. So the first action, and I'm going through a list of what can we do, perhaps, to try and begin the journey of transformation. Learn the truth about Karbala. We need to learn more about Imam Hussain al-Islam. We need to analyze more, meaning for ourselves, the events and the impact of the events. If trying to buy an iPhone makes me spend at least five hours in comparing every version of the Android and other systems and whatever, this is for our hereafter, how many hours should we start spending on trying to analyze Karbala? Number two, let us, Mominin, please outsource our akal or our fikr to anybody else. Allah has given us the kuwai akaliya and it becomes incumbent upon us to use that. And that is why we are told that in the matters of faith, in the matters of usul, there is no such thing as taqlid. And the most important thing that we have, it is tahqiq that we talk about. No one can tell you that two plus two is four unless you understand it. That is tahqiq. If you ask, of course, when you ask an accountant, if it is a Gujarati accountant, say, tamare ketla karwaj. How much? But two plus two is four, but we need to understand it. That is tahqiq. I will give you an example of what I mean. This is not in ether. This is not a, you know, sort of a highfalutin philosophy. I'm talking about the fundamentals and the basics of what we do when we sometimes outsource our akl. Because Karbala is an icon for the truth. No falsehood can be attached to it. Do we all agree? That Karbala cannot have any infiltration of any untruth in it. And therefore the word used in Arabic is tahrif. It is derived from the root word of harafa, which means to slant, to alter, to destroy, to misconstrue. So tahrif is when the literal form of a statement is changed. When sometimes the words or the phrases are deleted or the sequence or sentences are altered. And in this day and age, you pick up a YouTube video, you put in a couple of sentences, you add your own caption to it, which has no relation to what the speaker has said. And lo and behold, the whole world starts believing, oh my God, how, do you, how could he say this? This is called tahrif. The idea of changing. Well, there is a whole corpus of literature that has been created by Shahid Ustad Mutahari. Go to alislam.org, Google this book. It says Ashura, Misrepresentation and Distortions. And he's going to shock you. He's going to shock you in terms of how Karbala has been totally misconstrued by vested interest and just to create and raise those emotions so that we become emotionally charged up. When the emotions go down, we go back on our merry ways. No transformation. A great scholar, Haji Mirza Hussain Nuri, who Mutahari quotes, and he was a teacher of Sheikh Abbas Kumi, a great scholar and a compiler of the Book of Duas. He writes, and I quote, and we need to understand these words. He says, today too, 
we must mourn Hussein. But there are tragedies which have befallen Hussein in our era which did not occur in the past. And there are all these falsehoods that are said regarding the event of Karbala which no one opposes. This is stated by Nuri and he has a whole host of catalogs to say where and how this tarif has been done. I'll give you an example as to how tarif can happen and how do we analyze. Some of you may have heard it. I heard it as a child. This particular uh, masaib in the Urdu language. That Imam Ali al-Islam was delivering a sermon from the member. And suddenly, within that sermon, Imam Hussain al-Islam stands up and says, I'm thirsty. And Imam, Imam Ali says, let somebody bring water for my son. And the first person to get up and to bring that water was Hazrat Abbas. We remember him tonight. And it was on the eighth night, which is a traditional night, when these masaibs were recited. That a little boy, Abul Fazil Abbas, stands up to go and get water. And the story goes that in his rush to bring back the water, the glass fell down and Imam Ali al-Islam cried. It was a very emotive way of expressing it. Now, analyze that. Imam Ali started giving formal khutbas when he was in Kufa as a Khalifa. Imam Hussein al Islam must have been at least 30 to 35 years old. Hazrat Abbas would be 15 years old, approximately. Is it conceivable that a 33 year old man stands up in the middle of the Khalifa of the Muslims who is giving a sermon to say that I am thirsty, I need some water? This is but an, a small example of the tarif that takes place and sometimes as audiences, we swallow it hook, line and sinker. Without any analysis in the emotions that we have. You know, this kind of thing of tarif is actually the legacy of Muawiyah and Abu Huraira. Huraira was once approached by a merchant and says, I bought a whole stock of onions and my onions are rotting because the heat has increased and the onions are not selling. He was speculating on onions being short in, in the season, so he would store them. But the temperatures went so high that his onions started wilting and spoiling. So Abu Huraira said, okay, on such and so on Friday, after the prayers, you come to Makkah and bring your onions with you. This man was from a place called Akka. And Abu Huraira, after the Friday prayers, announces that I've heard from the Prophet, Nauzubillah, that whoever smells the onions of Akka in Makkah will go to Jannah. And all his onions were sold. I don't know whether Abu Huraira got a cut out of it or not. That remains buried in history. But this is the legacy of the likes of Abu Huraira to have tahrif. And therefore, Mominin, we need to challenge the falsehoods. But how can you challenge a falsehood? Unless you know the truth. Unless you have read Abu Mikhnaf. Unless you have read the authentic sources like the Luhuf, for example. In all these books, today we don't have excuse. All these books are not only translated in English, they're available online at the touch of a button. You can even read it on your iPhone while you're resting or doing whatever. The point is, we need to have the correct interpretation and the correct story of Karbala to be able to challenge this for how long? Because there is no sincerity of purpose, and when there is no sincerity of purpose, then there cannot be transformation. Here, 
there is a man who comes to a great scholar and says, I saw a dream when I saw that I'm biting away, nozubillah, of the flesh from the body of Imam Hussein. I saw this dream. I mean, it's a jarring dream if you get a dream like that. And uh, the scholar put his head down, thought for a moment, reflected, and he knew. He said, perhaps you are a Marcia Khan? He said, yes, I am. So he said, hereafter, either abandon your Marcia Khani altogether or draw your material from reliable books. You are tearing away at the flesh of Imam with these lies of yours. It was God's grace that he showed this to you in a dream. This is serious. And we see this all the time. And today, in this day and age of the videos and you know, graphic presentations and what have you, if you listen to some of the words, Mu'mineen, and if you truly understand the words, it is bordering on shirk. It is bordering on shirk. And yet, in the memory of Imam Hussain al-Islam, the community is sometimes silent, or doesn't care, or doesn't understand. Second, action that we need to take for transformation. Share the message. This is a universal message. And Josh Majabadi said so well to say that in Sanko Bedar to Hole Nedo, Harkom Pukaregi, Hamare Hai Hosei. Powerful words that the entire world will say. But in Sanko Bedar to Hole Nedo, well, we have to be Bedar ourselves first before we are going to share the message. And the opportunity to share the message is phenomenal today. Social media can be a good or a bad thing. It's a double-edged sword. It is doable because Karbala has that alchemic power of turning lead into gold. And then transform the mindset. Transformation comes, you know, they say, Whatever, if you, for example, if you're a golfer, you probably say that the longest hole in the game of golf is between the two years. It's how you think. It's here. Unless there's a transformation of that mindset that we have towards Karbala, so we should stop viewing Karbala as a distant tragedy and allow to immerse ourselves into that spirit in a practical way. I've uh, described it two other ways before we can go on to say on which side of the history are we standing. The subject tomorrow in, in Shishala will be the idea of Husseiniyat and Yazidiyat, which will be tomorrow. But today I just want to focus a little bit on how not to be the follower of Imam Hussain al-Islam. I call it the Kufi conundrum. Many people claim allegiance did nothing to help Imam Hussain al -Islam. And after the tragedy, they were left with a great burden of remorse and guilt. For example, Ubedillah ibn Hur al jofi he refused to help Imam Hussain al -Islam. Then he realizes the gravity of his mistakes. Then he spends the rest of his life trying to recover from his error. He fought, he wrote poetry, he did all these things. May Allah give him tawfiq for what he did. But when the time came, when the time for action was there, he backed off. How many times, Mominin, do we back off when somebody is being oppressed, when somebody is being maligned for no reason, and you know that this is not true, and you stay quiet, nothing to do with me. Why should I get involved in this? I don't want to get involved in this. Uh, Meyer, why should I? When something wrong is being done to my fellow human being, I back off. That is the legacy of the Kufans. It was the Kufans who invited Imam. They were eager to follow him as a guide and leader. In truth, they had not really prepared for the Imam. Because when they were threatened by the authorities of the time, they sat back. They had no guts. They abandoned 
the invited leader to the tragedy. And as I said, many of them lived a life of remorse. And then the other, the fourth formula in terms of transformation is be righteous. Be righteous. The idea of bir that we have been talking about. And being righteous in this society especially which expects and sees people for what they are, whether you're in the corporate world, whether you're in education, wherever you are, to actually live with integrity. To live with integrity, being honest, being honorable, being yourself and the best that you can offer. The idea of being righteous is to live with integrity. Do you know how do you describe integrity? That you're actually, integrity is that you signal one way, you signal left, and then you turn right. That is not integrity. People need to see from your actions exactly where you stand. And then as you try and be righteous, then don't go overboard to be self-righteous. Because that is dangerous. That is being judgmental. Considering oneself better than others due to one's own esteemed goodness, my self-esteem as to who I am, is right up there and I am becoming judgmental, is something that is frowned upon. That this is now being self-righteous, being holier than thou. I am better than anybody else. Do you know who said that? This was shaitan. The arrogance which is synonymous with that of Iblis, who refused a status, was the first one to say, I am better than him. This self-righteousness also hinders our transformation. And then number five, let us define who we are and stand up for what we believe in. If we are Husseinis, then that belief system does not change. We cannot allow somebody else to give us a label as Muslims. You know, now you have labels, you know, the new different brands, like a supermarket. You are a moderate Muslim, you're a progressive Muslim, you're an enlightened Muslim, you're a modern Muslim, you're an extremist Muslim, you're a liberal Muslim, you're a conservative Muslim, and you're a reformed Muslim, and you're an orthodox Muslim, and so on and so forth. Because this is what labels have been given to Islam to say there is a moderate Islam, and there's a progressive Islam, and so on and so forth. Why are we accepting any labels? A Muslim is a Muslim is a Muslim. First and foremost, a Muslim is a good human being. That is the fundamental thing. And then he builds upon his faith and says, I submit myself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I do the taslim and I am a Muslim and these are my values. These are the values that I, I adhere to of integrity, of being righteous, of making sure that I'm not usurping somebody else's rights. This is fundamental. Islam is, as the Blessed Prophet of Islam brought to us, and it is in its simplicity, in its most simplest form, when the Blessed Prophet was asked what is faith, he said doing something good pleases you, doing something bad displeases you, that is Islam. We move on through many other trajectories, but this is the basis. Then, we described this before, that be an intentional society as a group. Let us be an intentional society. There is an accidental society, which I described a few days ago, that there is coexistence, but there is no cooperation. It's like people flying on a plane or or passengers on a train, all they care about is getting to the destination. That's an accidental society. An intentional society is one where we respect the rights of each other. We help each other out. This is the basis. And that is the concept of the society of believers that the Blessed Prophet prescribed for us. This is the society. The first words is mutual love. 
The blessed prophet says, in their mutual love, compassion, and sympathy for one another, believers are like one body. When one part of it suffers a complaint, all other parts join in, sharing in the sleeplessness and in fever. This is the composition of the ummah as we know. Therefore, and we describe this, that an individual is important within a society, I have a contribution to make to my society. And society has a responsibility to uphold me and to help me. The couplet by Allah Iqbal is that Fard Kaim Rabte Millat se hai, Tanha kuch bhi nahi, Moj darya mein hai, Birune darya kuch bhi nahi. Idea of that society to say that the individual is established by his or her connection to the society. Otherwise, an individual is nothing, a drop. At the same time, the wave, the society, the wave is in the waters, outside a drop is simply nothing. If we are to have the transformation, then indeed this is what we need to work to. That as members of any society, whether it's oil as an organization or the wider society or the city that you live in, we all live as members of a society, that there needs to be a consensus of mind, that we share the same vision, not the same view. We may have different views. We all sort of may have different horizons, but we we'll all live under the same sky. Consensus of heart, that we hold the same values, and a commitment to activism. Whatever we want to do, these members exert to actualize those values through constructive engagement. That is the essence of being a member of your organization. Particularly, you know, the baby boomers sitting here came to this country with that wave that came for education or business or whatever we did, and we tried to create, recreate societies as best as we could with the resources that we had. There are some pioneers sitting right here when they first came to Toronto, and they remember what they did. We moved on. We moved on from there, and now, what needs to happen is, first, the next generation needs to understand that they are swimming in the facilities that were created by the elders who have come here. The next generation is now duty-bound to, to create societies where their children and their children's children would be nurtured. It's a continuum. Shaidu Saad Mutari said, you don't have to worry about seven generations. You just need to worry about one generation, the next generation. Because if you nurture the next generation correctly and properly within the ethos of the faith that we have and the values that we have of being good human beings and good Muslims, then that generation will nurture the next one. Thankfully, and I say this with a lot of reflection and thought, and please I should not be misunderstood that thankfully, more than half of our work is done as parents and as grandparents in this land because some of these Islamic values exist far more than they exist in the Muslim countries. We would have to work much harder to bring them up, nurture them than we have to do here. Very quickly, what can you give? You can give intellectual capital. Mashallah, we have a lot of it. What can you give? What else can you give? You can give social capital. Provide an element of passion and enthusiasm for the community. And I said a few days ago, the progress of a society is with more who are ready to give, less who are ready to take, then that society moves faster than when you have more takers and a few givers. Here is the saying of the Blessed Prophet that the wealthy who does not wait to spend in the way of Allah until a needy comes to his door, but goes to the abode of the poor to mitigate his suffering is a true muttaqi. Social relations and stepping out to assist someone else. So how much have we given? What is the limit? Is an example that has been set in Karbala. And this indeed is a lesson for us. Salawat. Yeah.